just like gravity is the same no matter where you are, so the human condition is the same. It's what we do with the human condition that really separates us from each other. And most of that has to do with our relationship with God. One so, second, one more. Eh, Thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm going to leave some. Oh, we have to Let's take a stack and put it back here in case when people come in, they, uh, they don't want to go. Okay. Um, I'm going to begin with just a, a simple prayer. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, to the age of ages. Amen. Amen. Have a seat, and we're going to glorify God. And we can, we can spend an entire class on how to pray appropriately. In other words, the different parts of a prayer. The, the, you know, the, 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 the glory, the petition, the thanksgiving, and so forth. And, but that's... I have a beautiful... 20-something page paper I wrote an exegesis on the Lord's Prayer. You know what exegesis comes from? Exegesis. Exegesis. Explanation. The Greek word explanation. So the Lord's Prayer is what? Uh, four, three verses? Four verses? Our Father who art in heaven? I have like a 30-something page paper on it because each word you have to look at what the original Greek was, how it's translated, what is the syntax of the word, how, did, how is it used, this, this may be preposition, this uh, clause in the Old Testament, where does this come from, how, how did, what did it mean now, how do we understand it, and so forth, so forth, so forth. So it's just, we, we can dissect the Bible in a thousand different ways. And I say this today because we are going to really begin the ambitious task of covering the entire Old Testament in one presentation. So, um, so two things, it's just so much. We'll do as much as we can if we can get through it. Maybe blessed night of Lumeno. If we can't get through the entire thing, we can make the next presentation uh, the part two of this. Even though I already have the next title of the next Catechism 101, which will be the 11th of February, Jesus Christ, the New Adam. So we'll talk about the incarnation, why why God had to become man. All right, but that's that might be pushed back depending on how far, how far we we get here. Now I'm going to be. I'm going to make a plug for our bookstore because you, right now we said if you this is this is the Mac Daddy of Bibles, okay? So this is New Testament and Old Testament Orthodox Study Bible. Why? Because in here we have, as I mentioned before, not just the actual text, but we have also commentary, which means they tell you a little bit about maybe explains it a little bit, also gives you an interpretation, and it also connects the passage to the Feast of the Church. So, then you know the Evangelio and the Apostolo, but there is a lot of the Ecclesia, because it is based on this Apostolo message, and it is based on this. Why do we read this epistle during this feast? Why, uh, why is, why do the father, what do the Father say about this particular one? And it also has the other things like, um, Placing a person like a ruler within the historical context of, uh, let's say, Mesopotamia or or, uh, or the Middle East or or Jerusalem. So it's a lot. But but in above and beyond that, there are morning prayers and evening prayers inside this book for Orthodox Christians. But it also has some incredible articles. The Bible, God's revelation to man. Okay, that's on page 1753. And if I, if I read it to you, it's, it's you know, two and a half pages, so I'm not going to read one paragraph, okay? For the Christian of true worship, the Bible is the greatest source of truth, virtue, and moral ethics. It's an invaluable source of teaching, doctrine, and holiness. We call it the book of life. For in, it, for in its pages, we find the closest expression we have of the inexpressible. The closest expression that we have of the inexpressible. What does that mean? How one of the wonderful ways of, of trying to understand God is he's uncontainable, inexpressible. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about just quickly apophatic and cataphatic theology. What? So, cataphatic theology is basically understanding what God is. 
And, and apophatic theology, we, we understand God by, telling, by explaining what he's not. He's not the source of evil. He's not the source of darkness. He's not, he's not you know, this, he's not that. So we try to describe. Remember, within the context of this book is part of the revelation of God, because God has revealed himself after 95 AD, which was when this canon, this collection of, of Old and New Testament was established by the, by the church, or the last book was written in 95, the canon was established a few a hundred years afterwards. But the Holy Spirit is still present. God reveals himself through the life of the church, through the saints and through miracles and, and so forth and so on. But the bottom line is that within here, we have a lot about God. And yet, even though this, this book has 2,000 pages, it doesn't even scratch the surface of who God is. And we can try to understand how can we as creation understand the creator? You know, whenever people ask me questions that, not, they're not even just above my pay grade, they are just, I can't. The only answer, and it wouldn't be fair, would be an, a cliche answer. Well, yeah, God needed another angel. No, that's not why your seven-year-old daughter died. That's the worst thing that we could say sometimes, really. Because then what? God needs angels so bad that he took, he took my child? What kind of God is that, right? That's not our God. God's God of love. The word is mystery, constantly. Mystery because we, for some reason, cannot fathom or contain or, 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 or reasonably understand who God is. He's just so much more than what we're... Just, just like, think about what we've discovered in the last 50 years in the, in the universe, right? We think that, or, or in the last 500 years, in where we understood before Columbus what the world was like. So. The difference is that science is not, gonna, is not going to um, help us understand God. Actually, science, I think, eventually will bring us back to God. That's my understanding. Uh, that's how I feel. But um, So when we talk about the Old Testament, we are talking about, one, the Old Testament, for the most part, the history of God revealing himself to one specific people, to the ancient Israelites, to the Jews. That's really what we see in the Old Testament. And their record of that. Okay? So, um, I have a lot. So let's talk about what is Revelation from the first page, okay? Simply speaking, God reveals something. He lets us know about himself. God reveals himself from history, the ancient Israelites, Abraham 2000 uh, BC, to the birth of Christ. Okay? And then Jesus is or becomes the ultimate revelation. Remember, we talked uh, last month that when Jesus was speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, or as the, the, uh, the author of Matthew, Matthew writes, uh, Jesus' collection of speeches uh, and places him on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have been told by Moses, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemy. And one of the, so he's basically saying, you've been told by your neighbor, you can put away your wife, but I tell you. He, he gives us these commandments and he sort of says, I am above the Old Testament. I am above the God of Moses. I am the true revelation. What you were told before was baby stuff. Now I'm going to give you the meat and potatoes. That was the appetizer. This is the real stuff. Okay? And it could be because it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is speaking to us. Right? And so that's, you can understand, that is the revel incredible revelation, the best revelation we've ever had. Again, God reveals himself. That's what, or Theos, just like we had the Theophania, or Theos, and he found that Mas milise. Mas milise metoyotu. Before it was God the Father's voice speaking, the burning bush, it was God speaking through the prophets, um, it was through the ark, the ark of the covenant, but now God becomes man and speaks to us. So what Jesus says trumps everything else. Do you understand that? 
Not that it conflicts. But again, the Old Testament has a tremendous amount of value for us. First, first and foremost, Jesus quotes it. One. Two, the fathers of the church quote it. And three, it has incredible theological um, truths about God and mankind. So those are some of the most important values. If we read it verbatim and we see and hear G God telling the ancient Israelites, when you conquer those polytheists in that region, I want you not just to kill the men, but kill the women and children. Right? We talked about this last time. What kind of God does that? And again, this is the ancient Israelites, the Jews, understanding of God, who was the source of everything. So when you didn't know who was going to come in the middle of the night and attack you and cut your throat and take away everything away, you needed to have someone say, Lord, take them before you take me. That was the ancient Israelites' understanding. And it wasn't egotistical. It was God-dependent. It was a God-dependent relationship. And that's what we've lost. Because we don't need God anymore. Because we've become gods. We have in a lot of ways. All right. So, we'll go quickly. <coughs> revelation, revelation unfolds gradually, and it's Christocentric. What Christ tells us about God, okay? Christocentric? Christo... Kendrico. Kendrico. So, in other words, first, the Old Testament has one, but one purpose, and that's to point to Christ. Everything in there is a preparation for the coming of Christ. And as Christians, that's how we have to read the Old Testament. Okay? Um, and, and, God, and Christ tells us about his Father. He says, I and my Father are one. How do you not know the Father if you've been with me? Right? So he tells us constantly over and over again, if you blaspheme me against the Son, it will be forgiven. But if you blaspheme me against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. I will send you the comforter, the spirit of truth. And so Jesus tells us about God the Father, God, uh, God the Father, and God the Spirit. He reveals himself. Let me just turn this off. Because I'm not going to be able to help anybody until we're done anyway. So but remind me at the end to turn it back on. Um, okay, so the Bible, the Old Testament, talks about. God. Now, Christ reveals us about God. The ancient Israelites have sort of a historical revelation. Well, God appeared to Abraham on this day, and then God appeared to Moses, and then God appeared to Aaron, and then yada, yada, and all, all this stuff. So we, and, and they'll talk about, I mean, you can match up the historical uh, ancient Israelites uh, uh, timeline with when God appeared to them. So there's some correlation within this. So in, in the Old Testament, we find out, listen, this is how the ancient Israelites got their religion. Remember, before God appeared to Abraham and said, I will be your God, or Abram, before he became Abraham, I will be your God and you will be my people, everybody was polytheistic. Many religions, many gods, I should say. It was that they were the first monotheistic religion, the first religion that believed only in one God. Okay. So God's revelation is instructive and salvatory. It teaches us how to live, and in the end, really, how to be saved. And it teaches us about himself and us and the world. Remember, again, these notes, some of them are from a long time ago <laughs> that I wrote. They're not footnoted, so don't ever publish what I write, okay? Uh, but you can use it for your own edification. So, um, tradition. Divine revelation is in the tradition of the people of God. The Bible is part expression and part tradition. Tradition is, dis, is, the, is the distinct understanding of God, the human person, creation, and of all reality that flows from divine revelation. So, tradition isn't just, uh, you know, there's two traditions. There's the tradition with the big T and the tradition with the little T. When we have a makaria after a funeral, that's the little T tradition, right? Uh, when we say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's the big tradition, okay? So, so, so these, the big tradition things are part, because sometimes they, make, they tell us, oh, you guys are a religion, you're Orthodox, you're a religion of traditions, and that's it. Not, not scripture, not dogma. I'm sorry. All of it's tradition. 
all of it's part of the process of the development of the Christian religion. So it's part of the tradition of the religion, including scripture. That's why we say, when the Protestant church says, this is our God, we say, I'm sorry, that's incomplete. God didn't appear here and then leave after it was written. God is alive and active and reveals himself in the life of the church even after the Bible was written. Even after it was written. Okay. Um, it is the traditions, the guidance, the fundamental beliefs that guide the next generation. Tradition first started orally, passed on by word of mouth. The Old Testament writing started 800 B.C., written in Hebrew, 49 books. The, the story of the ancient Israelites and God's revelation to them is covered chronologically from 2000 to 1 B.C. And that includes the other, remember, the Old Testament in the Orthodox tradition has 10 additional books or parts of books that are above and beyond what the, the Jewish faith and what the Protestant faith say is part of the collection of the Old Testament books. Um, the New Testament has 27 books, and um, uh, they really talk about Christ. Um, so and it starts from 1 AD to about 100 or 95 AD. Mark and Matthew, we say 50, probably 75. Uh, and this is the first book in, Ar and, uh, first of all, it's not Arabic, probably Aramaic, but uh, that's still debated. So. We can, you can leave that alone or cross that out. We can, you know, it's funny, when I wrote this about 20 years ago, this part, there was still a good strong belief that Mark was, was originally written in Aramaic, as an Aramaic version of Mark. And the last 20 years, most of scholars have uh, kind of killed that uh, theory. But again, this is part of uh, learning about it. It doesn't affect our faith, you know, whatever. It doesn't make a difference, it's here. That's all that matters. How it got here, that's part of God's plan, not ours. Interpretation. St. Paul to 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God. The Bible reflects the actions of God. But again, the Bible only reflects a little bit. We only know a little bit about God, but what we know is enough to be saved. And that's why I say cataphatic and apophatic theology. God helped to write it then and today to interpret it, right? So there's a qualitative difference from other books. In other words, if God wrote everything, then the style, the syntax, everything would be the same. But God uses that synergistic effort. He uses the person with his knowledge, his experience, and he sends the Holy Spirit to inspire that person to be able to write. Just like God gives us grapes, and we take the grapes, we're meant to make them wine. God gives us wheat, we take the wheat, we grind it, we make flour, we put some water, a little bit of salt, some yeast maybe, and we make bread. Then we take the wine, and then he changes it to the blood of Christ. And then we take the bread, and he changes it to the body of Christ. See how we're co-creators in Holy Communion. In the same way, we're co-creators in the Holy Word of God. God uses humanity, which again tells us how holy the human race is. Again, that image and likeness. Ο κάθε ευαγγελιστή, ο κάθε, κάθε άνθρωπο που έγραψε ένα από τα βιβλία τη uh, της Αγία Γραφή, ο Θεό τον χρησιμοποιεί, χρησιμοποίησε. Χρησιμοποίησε. Μεταχειρίστηκε. That's not the right word. No, χρησιμοποίησε. Χρησιμοποίησε. So um, God uses us through not just within the life of the world, but to communicate his revelation. Because he speaks to us, and then we speak to others, too, even today. And think about both Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, it was centuries. In the New Testament, it was decades that went where, where the communication of the, of the holy words of God were not written, but communicated orally. So people talked and shared about it, just like 
We said Homer, right? We have the Iliad and the Odyssey and those ancient Greek texts. Okay, so um, in terms of in, in interpret interpretation, so okay, so heretic, uh, heretical extremes of interpretations, humanistic extreme. It's uh, that that the Bible is just another collection of books, and if you take a class in college, you can study the Bible as literature. <coughs> Uh, so there's no room for God's interpretation. The mechanistic understanding, every word in the Bible is God's word, so everything in the Bible is law. And, and the great thing is we have these fathers of the church, these incredible, holy, brilliant men who said, hey, when, when God is speaking about the sower of the sea and planting it, he's, he's obviously speaking allegorically, figuratively. And when he's telling you, don't steal, <laughs> he's telling you, literally. <laughs> so there are times, when, and, and the, the good news is that the fathers of the church give us a normative interpretation of scripture. That's why the commentary in the bottom of the Orthodox Study Bible is so valuable, because it could really give, a, give a, it gives us an understanding of, um, of what we're reading, or what the text is. How are we supposed to understand it? Remember, every passage can mean something special to you because of your life experience. Every passage can touch your heart in a special way because of what you've gone through. I can't tell you how many times people will come to me and say, even just a sermon, Father, I needed that. This is what I'm going through. Father, you said this, that. And well, I had no idea <laughs> what I was going to say, but it meant something special to you because of what you were going through in your life, and somehow the Holy Spirit worked through that. But that doesn't mean that's what it means for, for universally for everyone. You, we all can have a special meaning, but it, it will always have a universal understanding, generally. And then we can always artistically understand it at a different level. Um, I always love looking at scripture and saying, hmm. Or looking at what I wrote 20 years ago, and then saying, wow, I never saw the depth. I, I didn't, how come I miss this, and I miss that, and I miss that? It's because there's 20 year, years less of experience as a human being, or as a priest. All right, so. At this pace, <laughs> you're much no mess. Okay, so scriptures are to be interpreted. We have to look at the historical context. Where was it written? What was the political condition of the the, the land uh, at that time? Uh, uh, who was who was it written by? Okay, um, look at the literary style. Right, there are different different styles. Some some books sound more like poems than they do like books. Some like if you read. Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's like, okay, they're counting everybody and they're telling you, and it's it just it's so long. Like when people say, I'm gonna read the Old Testament, they go through Genesis and, and Exodus and they're so excited, and then they get the you know Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and everyone's like, Oh my goodness, I can't, you know, it's just like it's 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 numbers and then this was and they built the ark with this wood and this was the measurement and it's over and it becomes difficult to get through a lot of that but that's all of that was very important this is why the orthodox church looks as beautiful as it does because God really he said no you're going to get this kind of wood or the, and you're going to make this kind of shape and it's going to be exactly this big and and that's why you know it's it's as beautiful as it is because it, God wants it that way but what I always say is as long as no one is starving outside, because if someone, if someone is starving outside of our church, it's better to melt the chalice and feed that person than to have that beautiful stuff inside there, right? We have to have that good balance. Okay, look at, degree, uh, look, at the, look at the degree of divine inspiration. So again, the Old Testament doesn't have the same divine inspiration, the same value as the New Testament does. And the Gospels have a higher value, in a sense. Why do you sit in the epistle and stand in the gospel? Because, because, because what? Because the epistle was written by the apostolos and the gospel is actually Jesus speaking. Okay. No? But, yes. Oh. That's, a good, that's a good answer. But remember, before the, before the Orthodox Church came to the United States, were we sitting anyway? No. Right, so no. it's always standing anyway. Even, in, of a later even today, or Russia. Right, they, Russia. They don't, uh, uh, this Russia is the American, the yeah, yeah, the American no, uh, flair. Now I know. I look what happened. They have chairs on Greece? Yeah, they do. Well, oh, yeah. the big churches all have chairs. The old churches. Some of the churches. You have the things on the side. Yeah. Yeah. You can sit on the side. Stasidia. 
Um, need to see the text or books as part of the general content. You have to understand that Exodus is, is a continuation of Genesis and or, or First Kings and Second Kings and Third Kings or Samuel. There is there there is a purpose and, and, and a reason behind the context. Just like the Book of Acts is right after the Bible, the Gospels, because the Book of Acts really tells us a lot about the early church. So everything has a sort of general uh, flow to it. Okay, so we are all meant to read the Holy Scripture, but the church is the ultimate interpreter. Okay, we said that just before. We need to see the scripture as a pointer. Again, it points to Christ. The New Testament is an obvious point to Christ. The Old Testament sometimes is harder to understand, to see it. We always try to avoid extremes when interpreting the Bible. And the parable of the sower shows us that we must interpret sometimes out of God bless you. So uh, we, know, we know the parable of the sower. Everybody know what I'm talking about when I say the parable of the sower? No. Isn't that where you reap what you sow? Isn't that where it kind of like originated? Mm, no, you, what you sow is actually somewhere else too. But because actually, the uh, there's a couple of parables that say you don't necessarily reap what you sow. All right, you can you can sow, you can reap it without sowing it. Sowing means to plant the seed, okay? And you can sow like just like the parable of the talents, because the one the one servant who only got one was scared because he goes, you reap where you don't sow. You know, like you make money up and you don't have to do the work. Other people do the work for you. But really, the parable of the talents is simply that um, a, a farmer goes and spreads seed and he puts seed on fertile ground, on uh, rocky ground, on, a, on uh, ground with weeds, and, and also on a worn path. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, when it was time, so then he says, the, the seed that on the rocky ground got dry and, and you know, that couldn't grow any roots. The one on the uh, rocky ground got some roots, but then... Uh, withered. Uh, but then it withered because uh, at, during a storm or whatever. Uh, it, it, and then the, the one in the, with the thorns and the weeds got choked up by the cares of life. And then the one seed that was planted in the good soil grew and had, and fold, and, uh, uh, had 100 folds of fruit. So then, and then he says something like, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And his disciples go, hey, Jesus, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they're like, what did you just say? And then he says, ah, for you who are close, you know, for, for those I speak in parables, but for you, you who are close to me, uh, I'll basically speak more bluntly. And he says, the seed is the word of God. And basically, the, the types of soil condition represent the types of souls of believers that receive. And he says, the, the, the one who's like the wayside is the one whose heart is hard. The one who's on the, on the rock you know, is the one that's hard, who doesn't, who hears it, maybe has a little bit of excitement, but then, you know, it never, never takes ground. And the other one that uh, takes this, the roots take ground. Then the other one goes by the rocks and is doing well. And it's like the Christian who does well, but then when there's persecutions, he runs, you know, he, he doesn't stay. They just, there's, there's no depth in the root. And then the other one is like the Christian who hears the word of God and rejoices, but then he gets caught up and choked by the cares of this world. And then the last is the, the Christian who hears the word of God or the believer who hears the word of God. And, and the seed takes root and the tree grows and produces a hundredfold of fruit. So basically he's saying that the soil is the heart. And then beautiful commentary from people like St. John Chrysostom. He said, what, what kind of foolish farmer would throw seeds on a worn path or in rocky soil? Why would you waste good seed on that? And the answer is, one, because it, with God's rational flock, it's possible for the wayside not to be wayside and to become fertile and the rocks to be taken away and the weeds to be cut out. In other words, God's seed falls on everyone. He's always sending his seed, his word of God, on everyone, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey at that moment, with the hope that you will change 
and have the fertile soil. Right? I always tell people, stay away from judging someone else at any one given time because you might just get them at the worst possible day or at the, one of the most challenging times in their lives. And it's not about saying, this is how this person is. No. Right? We say, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Right? We have to accept them because this is the journey. The journey, our spiritual journeys are like this. You know? Sometimes we find ourselves here, and that's all we see the person, and we make that judgment. And that person, listen, it's not about falling. It's about getting up. We all fall. We will fall again. But we get up and we avoid the same things that we stumbled over the, before. That's, that's the key to life. <laughs> Learn from your mistakes. Don't let your ego get the best of you. Love God and love your neighbor, period. You're done. You don't need me anymore. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so that's why some scripture needs to be literally understood. Some needs to be figurative or allegorically understood. And then there are things like the Orthodox Church has, and this is maybe one of the differences between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, we have ecclesiastical divorces. Jesus says plainly, hey, unless you are guilty of, or your wife or your spouse is guilty of uh, adultery, you cannot get divorced. And if you marry somebody, then you're, you're committing adultery if they were already married. So the church says, hmm, what do we do? So the Catholic church says, well, we got to go by the word of God, and that's it. So let's have these annulments where the marriage never took place, and where children, okay, if they're children, then uh, we just don't, let's not deal with that right now, okay? So, uh, so that, that really was never really a marriage, and we can't say that. The Orthodox church simply says, yes, that's what the Bible says. That's the ultimate. That's the ultimate authority. That's what we want. Everybody okay? Yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. So, and really, if you think about it, we priests, we're never allowed to remarry. We marry once. That's it. And even if my wife commits adultery, I can't remarry. Okay. And if she did, I still love her. Right? That's my job, is to forgive her. Um, but the bottom line is this, that um, in the Orthodox Church, we understand that we live in a fallen world, and that sometimes, this is one of the reasons why we have what we have, we allow someone who's married and has a physical death to their spouse to remarry, don't we? Right? Sometimes there's a spiritual death to a marriage. Sometimes both parties, sometimes it's 95% and 5%, have allowed the devil to get inside that, that relationship, that marriage. And it's spiritually dead. There's nothing that can revive it. So the church says, we will declare it spiritually dead, dissolved, and we will give you the blessing to remarry again. Which is more of an understanding. So are we taking Jesus' words and not being true to it? Perhaps we are. But I think that I would rather do it this way than say, no, we're going to go by his word and find another way of going behind. And not justifying a life lived for a number of years beautifully, for at least a period of time, that produced wonderful children and, and, and all that. Right? I think the Orthodox Church has it right. Nevertheless, we still, this is the word of God. And there are some things, absolutely, that we, we do not want to change. And, um, and some things that we have to understand literally and some things that we have to understand figuratively. And it's not about us deciding what is what. We have a normative understanding of, of understanding Scripture, what it means. Okay, Scripture in the church. We, we had said before there were, thank you so much, there are like over 200 verses in the Old and New Testament from, uh, in the liturgy, in Orthros. So... I feel bad now. No one else has water. Who else wants water? water. <laughs> no, this water over there. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the Bible is read constantly, constantly inside the church. God bless you. We are Bible Christians. 
Um, Orthodox are scripturally concerned that church fathers only quote the Bible, not themselves. Whenever they quote, they say, this is what it says, da, da, da. And the correct understanding of scripture, it's not, it, it, it is of the church, by the church, and for the church. Remember, the, look at St. Paul's letters. St. Paul was writing to a church that he just visited. St. Paul established that church, and he's writing to that church. So, scripture was written by someone in the church, for the church, and it's by the church in the end, because the church afterwards reads it regularly as we have it. So for us to say that we're going to remove this from the church or from the rest of the church tradition is wrong. This is the greatest source of tradition, but it's part of tradition. All right. Um, we as believers are encouraged to take advantage of the scriptures. What does that mean? Reading it. Studying it. Being here. I'm preaching to the choir. You're here. So that's, that's good. But if you looked at your stewardship packets, which, by the way, if you did not get one on Sunday, Joan will give you one at the end. But inside, inside the stewardship packet, I have a daily Bible reading guide. Orthodox Christians have a daily lectionary of what we should read depending on the feast and the, and, and the saints and the time of the year. So we're called to read the Bible. Very important. Okay. The Old Testament. The word testament means covenant, bond, agreement. It focused on God's revelation to the Israelites. Forget the apostrophe. Sorry about all these. There's a lot of typos in here. Stories were passed on orally until it was written down around 900 B.C. <laughs> Um, so, I say here, Moses probably did not commit it to writing. Remember, so Moses is around 1250 B.C. They, the ancient Israelites, even the fathers of the church, um, uh, basically give credit to Moses as the author of the first five books, the Pentateuch, or the, the books of the law, um, uh, that he wrote it. Now, the problem that we have with this is, Moses is wandering the desert for 40 years. To write the Bible, the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, when you really, the, the primary way of writing was tablets, you would have, it would be so costly to do that that you really had to have a socioeconomic uh, 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 structure inside. You'd have to have a government that could be able to take taxes and to commit people to be writing this. People in the desert wandering for 40 years, which is what Moses had, there was no way to do it. So it was probably written under David and, uh, and Solomon in the 900s B.C. It doesn't make a difference. Moses read it. He said it. They just kept it orally until, you know, so Moses is still understood as the author of that. All right. Um, in 250 B.C., I told you, the Hebrew books are translated to Greek in Alexandria. The version was called the Septuagint because it was translated by 70 translators. That's the Latin prefix for 70. All right, so then remember, all of that area by 250 BC has already been conquered by Alexander the Great and the Macedonians. And, um, and Greek and philosophy has been spread in there. And so these people, the, the, the educated people of that area, who maybe were not necessarily Jewish, but wanted to read the Jewish scripture, they wanted to have it translated. And that version of the Old Testament, the um, Septuagint, is one that's very important to us because remember, there are times when Jesus quotes the Old Testament and he, really, he literally quotes the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation for, of the Hebrew, which now we read in English. So it's translated twice. We say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, maybe some of these... Translators took some liberties. I don't know. The bottom line is, that's what we have. Um, there was a lack of information concerning a number of books called canons. In 90 AD, the rabbis in Palestine called the Council of Jamna. Uh, they settled, Jamna should be G-A-M-M-N-A. They settled on a number of books that would constitute the Bible. 22 books that ended up being 39 books altogether. The Deuterocanonical, the Orthodox Christian selected the second canon, 10 more books. Catholics only have 7 more. Protestant only 39. Books, the, the books are basically divided into three parts. Historical law, didactic wisdom, and prophecy. Those are the three different types of books generally. 
that are in the Old Testament, okay? They're the books of the law and history, they're the books of wisdom, and then the books of prophecy. So Genesis, we understand, and we went over this uh, last week, right? Last time, that God created everything out of nothing. He created everything in six days. On the seventh day, he rests. Keep on going, all right? Creation. The physical world is the work of God, not just spiritual world, okay? So you say, oh, God started and he just let it go. God is involved in the physical world. The world is not autonomous. He creates and he sustains. He didn't just create it and now it's going out of control like some of the scientists say that, you know, the universe is expanding and this and that. No, he sustains it. Creation is fundamentally good, remember? And God created and he said, and it was good. Right? We make it bad. We abuse matter. We abuse the things of this world and we make it bad. Man is the apex of the crown of creation. The ancient Israelites had primitive scientific understanding of the world. And like I said, there's two descriptions of the creation story. There's Genesis um, 1 to 2, 4, which is a six-day creation story. And then Genesis 2, uh, uh, 4 has a one-day creation story. So it's, it's kind of repeated again. All right. So the books of the law and history. The Torah are the first five books of or the Pentateuch of, of, of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. From the standpoint of, the or of Orthodox Christianity, the historical writings of the Old Testament point towards their incarnation of God, the Son, in Jesus Christ. The Old Testament as a whole is a foreshadowing of the New Testament revelation, a, a preparation for the advent of Christ. St. Paul stresses the Christocentric nature of the Old Testament a revelation in 2 Timothy. From childhood, he writes, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Israelites feel that the first five books written by Moses, they were almost all law books. Although Moses was said to be the author, there are a number of different traditions written by different authors. At least four different traditions of writings are written inside the five books. So probably Moses just passed on, or was part of that, and passed on the stories. But again, he's the one who has, who the, the ancient Israelites give as the author, even, even uh, the fathers of the church. The second part is the, uh, the books of history, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st uh, uh, and 2nd Chronicles, 1st Ezra, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Judith, Tobit, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabees. Those, a lot of them are, are in the Deuterocanonical, the, the second collection that are only in the Orthodox. But... So these are the books of history. So let's talk about the historical division. So we have the age of the patriarchs from 2000 to 1700 BC. This centers around Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of a new nation. Everybody know the story? So let's go through this, okay? So we have Abraham. God reveals himself to Abraham, and he says, I'll be your God, I'll give you my people. I will number you like the grains of sand. And, and Abraham, Abraham receives it and says, I will be your servant. Um, Abraham has had, had how many sons? Twelve. No? One. No? Two. 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 Oh, that's right. Okay, okay. from two own. different wives, right? That's right, right. yeah. Okay. So, but the one we always focus on is Isaac. Anybody remember the other guy? Who? Ishmael. 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 Very good. So Jacob is supposed to be the father of the Jews, and Ishmael the father of the... Arabs and Muslims, right now. And everybody knows the story about how he stole the birthright. It's another story, but yes, we'll, we'll yes. get into that. But anyway, so one, one of the most incredible stories of faith is here God tells Abraham. Now, normally we would, the, the, the people there would offer sacrifices. Again, when we talk about stewardship, 10%. They would give their first 10% of their crops or their cattle, or whatever their, their livelihood was, they would offer it back to God, knowing that he was the author of all of this. And so, traditionally, they would go to the place of sacrifice, they would go buy an animal if they had to, or they'd bring their own livestock, and they would offer it if they, if they weren't farmers, and if they are traders or something else, and they would uh, offer that to God. Now God says, I don't want you to make me an offering, I want you to offer me your son, Isaac the ultimate test. And Abraham goes up with his son and gets to the top of the mountain and takes a rock, 
about to sacrifice his son, and God sends an angel and says, stop. You don't have to do this. That's what happened to me when I almost ended up in Manchester. God said, stop. What's the way for you? <laughs> but I was obedient. It's so funny. <laughs> When we learn how to stop and not force things to happen the way we think we, they need to happen, it's incredible the journey that you allow yourself to go on. God knows so much better than us. He knows so much better than us. I have always, if only this would happen, and if only that would happen, and I know that this would happen, and then that would happen, and then that would happen, because I can relax. You're not in charge of your life anymore. You're not. In a single moment, death will supplant everything. And we saw with Jim, Bazookas. Who could have expected? It's these are mysteries. But we cannot plan. This is why I keep on telling you, don't wait to reconcile. Don't hold on to resentments. And resentments are the most draining spiritual realities that we have. Let go of them. You are a prisoner to the devil when you hold on to resentments. Astus. I don't want to tell you what my spiritual father tells me, right? It starts with an H in Greek. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs> 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 but father, they, you know, they, they, and I can move, bump, and you can tell it to me. I said, what'd you say, father? <laughs> Listen to me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, English translation, poop on them. But it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Very well said. <laughs> <laughs> so here Abraham shows the most incredible. Now I've said this before in church. You know, uh, there's no. You know, I never understood that sacrifice that God made for me in Jesus Christ until I became a daddy, not a father, but a daddy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, if you ask me to sacrifice myself for my child, I don't think I'd hesitate. You ask me to sacrifice my child for something? I think so. And yet, that's what God did for me and for you. That still blows my mind. That's the reason I'm a priest today. I really think. But that's, you know, so here God places Abraham in that incredible position. And Abraham passes the test. And so Abraham has a, a son. Uh, Isaac has a son. His, oh, how many sons did Isaac? I mean, uh, Isaac has a son. Ja Jacob. Jacob. Jacob has how many children? Twelve. Twelve. And who are those twelve? Who are those twelve children become? The twelve. The twelve tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. Right. And then you had one of the 12 children, Joseph, with the amazing color dream coat. <laughs> now we know the story of Joseph. Joseph is uh, basically, the rest of his brothers are envious of him. They beat him up, they throw him in a well, leave him half dead, throw him uh, slavery, in jail. He finds himself in jail. And then all of a sudden, um, he hears about the Pharaoh's dream, where seven skinny cows eat seven fat cows. And no one understands what the dream means, and Joseph says, I know what it means. You're going to have seven years of wonderful harvests, followed by seven years of famine. So make sure you stockpile everything during these seven years so that you have uh, the seven years waiting uh, in store and waiting for, so you have food, you don't starve that. And now all of a sudden, Joseph, Gets out of prison, he becomes, he gets into the royal court, and he, and he grows up in the palace, and he becomes like an adopted son to the Pharaoh. So, 
Joseph is a, a, is a wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 person in terms of the, the, the example that he has. Joseph is a foreshadow of Jesus, too, in a, in a, in a very beautiful way. And we remember him on, on Sunday night, which is the Orthros of Holy Monday. He's one of the three figures that we remember. Because Joseph now is standing in this incredible position of power. His brothers are starving because seven years have passed, and they're in famine. And they hear, hey, by the way, did I tell you that he ended up in Egypt? I didn't say that, maybe. Okay, so he found himself, he found himself in, a, in a jail in Egypt, and we said Pharaoh, so he, maybe they didn't. So they say, hey, Egypt, they got a lot of food over there. Let's go over there and see if we can get some of the food. And they go, and they see their brother, but they don't recognize him. But Joseph recognizes them. And now he's tempted. He can have them all put to death for what they did to him. And, and he toys with him for a little bit, too, yeah. all right? You know, bring Benjamin, bring the younger, then bring, bring my father, ja bring Jacob. Eventually, he says, it's me. I'm your, your brother Joseph. And he embraces them. And they come in. Now, the, uh, the Bible <coughs> says that a new Pharaoh came. And then knew him not any longer. In other words, he was no longer in the, in the good graces. And his brothers and their children and their grandchildren. And now the Jews become the slaves to the Egyptians. And now we have the Ten Commandments, the movie that we were all raised with, right? Uh, Cecil B. DeMille, was it Cecil Yes, yes. Right. yes. So we have... Mo, uh, so, so we're going to fast forward now. The, the, the ancient Israelites, so what we have here, let's go. The, page, the um, age of the patriarch. The period centers around Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Fathers of a new nation. Jacob's 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. The key to the 12 tribes is, okay, is God reveals himself to Abraham and the 12 tribes. The Israelites, one God, they have a covenant. God will be faithful to Abraham and the people if they are faithful to God. And one of the seals was the circumcision. Okay? Question. Yeah. How come uh, the Greeks didn't uh, take on circumcision? That only became a Jewish or Hebrew thing. Well, it's actually more of a 20th century thing than a, a Hebrew thing. I would say simply that we have a, a, a wonderful explanation of that, and that is in the book of Acts. In the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, we have what's called the Apostolic Council. During this time, Paul and Barnabas are um, proselytizing, doing mission work, and they run into a bunch of people, um, Christians, who were still very steep in Jewish tradition, and they said, they were telling the, these, uh, these Gentiles, now remember, Gentiles, this is first century, they didn't have the, the foundation of, 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 uh, of the Jewish religion, but they wanted to follow Jesus Christ. They wanted to be baptized. But these people were saying, oh, before you're baptized, you have to be circumcised. And Paul and Barnabas says, who told you that they have to be circumcised? So Paul and Barnabas say, hmm, um, we've never given that command, but instead of them deciding uh, that, no, you shouldn't do that, and telling them that, they said, let's go back to Jerusalem, let's call all the other apostles, and let's have a meeting. And this is how you have the first apostolic council, which becomes the model for the Orthodox Church's seven ecumenical councils, which says basically that the Spirit of God Jesus says, when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them, right? So it's not right for only one person to make a decision. Even the patriarch has a holy synod. He doesn't make decisions arbitrarily by himself. He's not infallible, right? So that model of uh, the synodical model, the model, the conciliar model, where there's a lot of people involved in the decisions of the church, started from there. So the disciples talked about this, and they said no. They prayed about it, they fasted, um, and then they talked about it, and they came up with a decree, decree, and it's in the book of Acts. It says that, that you don't need to be circumcised to be baptized. 
Okay. So why aren't Greeks circumcised? Or why aren't many Greeks or Greeks 40, 50 years ago in Greece bat, uh, circumcised? I don't know. Is, do, they, do they circumcise babies now in Greece still? No. They still don't. Okay. In here, you have a choice there. Here. A choice. There, there, they just generally it's not. The, no. the, the fault is you're not, you're not circumcised. Okay. So, um, so uh, they just didn't accept that. Well, they took that literally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that in the United States, they, the concern was hygiene, right? Mm -hmm. But I think today people say that it's not really an issue anymore, unless you're going to fight and be in the trenches for you know, years, but it's not an issue. So it's not <coughs> that the Greeks didn't. Okay. It was the Bible says you don't have to. Okay? If you want to be a Christian, you don't have to be circumcised. But they probably, the culture is more cultural that they didn't do that. Okay. Thank you. Sir, good question. We're no way we're going to get through this. All right. Maybe we'll get to the historical books and then we'll talk about the prophetic books next time. Okay. All right. So we were at Moses. Okay. So here we go. Moses and Exodus. This is Roman numeral two. Towards the top of the page. The Israelites immigrate to Egypt and become their slaves. Moses sees God at Mount Sinai, who gives Moses uh, the mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. So now you have, basically, uh, we know the story of Moses. Moses was a baby. They were, there was a, a, a law to kill the Jewish babies at one point, and so one of the mothers put the baby in the stream, and one of the young ladies in the, uh, in the palace finds him and takes him, raises him of his own. And, uh, once he realizes he, he is a Jew, then he says, I'm going to go back to my people. I'm going to be true to my, uh, to my lineage and to my origin. And he lives like a Jew. He leaves the palace. And eventually, as a shepherd, he comes across, on what mount? Sinai. Sinai. The burning bush. And this is what I love about the burning bush. The burning bush. After God reveals himself to Moses through the burning bush, he says, Moses says, who should I say sent me? Like, what, what is your name, God? Who? And he says, tell them, I am sent you. I am. The one who is. And I love how iconography... Iconography has on Jesus, or on... The article, Omicron Omega Ni, the one who is. So around Jesus, it has all on, the one who is, because Jesus is God as well. So this is, uh, this, is, this is what I call sad Jesus. This is the, the first and only icon I ever painted. And I figured it wasn't my gift. I'll talk about Jesus, but I won't draw Jesus. But this is the one that I did. Um, when I was at seminary, I go right after seminary. But it just, he's sad. And I think because as I'm painting him, I'm thinking about him looking at me, and I just can't have him smiling at me because I'm still, I still fall short. But I thought I had all on on here. All right. So um, Moses, now Mo, this is important because Moses, with audacity, comes in front of the Pharaoh and he says, Let my people go. And um, like a general, like a general, leading his people. And eventually, after several miracles, the Pharaoh acquiesces, and they, they're allowed to go, but then he has a change of heart, and then we have the parting of the Red Sea, and then... Um, so now, the, the Jews are free. Now remember, God promised Moses, I'm going to number you like the sands of the sea, I'm going to place you in a land of milk and honey, the promised land. You are my chosen people, and I will put you in the promised land. So the ancient Israelites, now they're freed from them. But Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, to get the law of God. And as he's up there for how long? 40 days. 40 and days and 40 nights. This no coincidences with the word four, with number 40, a lot of that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The people get restless. They're hungry. And they begin worshiping the pagan god, Baal. And uh, 
smelting uh, idols. So Moses comes back, and um, basically the punishment for the people of Israel for their lack of faith is that they will not enter the promised land. They will wander for 40 years in the desert. God will sustain them. But it's their children that will end up in the promised land. They will never see the promised land. And that's what happens for 40 years. The ancient Israelites wander the desert. But guess what? Every day, manna fell from heaven. Every day, God fed them. And I love the fact that the one day that somebody says to them, I say, I say this like a very casual way, says, hey, what happens if God doesn't show up tomorrow? Let's take some of this food and, and, and store it so that we can have some for tomorrow. When they get up the next morning, it was foul smelling. And God says to them, you idiots. <laughs> he said, every day I give you food and you go and you store some because you're scared I'm not going to come tomorrow. Every day I show up. This is, this is a lesson for all of us. Anyway. But the Sunday food, they, they could store the Sunday food and it wasn't foul. Only that day. It, but miracle. This was, right. But this is on another day, same amount of time, right? Yeah. Why is it that that day it happened to be? Because it was about them not trusting God. Or maybe the Sabbath, because they were Jewish. It was Jewish. Saturday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had food. Yeah, the they had Saturday, food yeah. On, so Friday would keep over for Saturday. So they would have to, yeah. So they didn't have to work on Saturday, on the Sabbath. All right, so we have um, now 40, now for 40 years they're wandering around, and now finally it's time for <coughs> them to get to the land of milk and honey. But guess what? This land was called Canaan. It was occupied. It was inhabited. And the overtaking of this land was a military battle. Yes, why does you say... Um, why do these, why do the Jews or why do the authors of the Old Testament write so harshly? Well, you know, this is what they did. They would come with the trumpet of God. They would, um, now mind you, in the desert, they had the Ten Commandments in this special box, along with other very holy things that they called the Ark of the Covenant. Most of you know it from the movie, The Raiders of the Lost yeah, Ark, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But this was a, an actual... A, so, so this would move around, and God would always be present in that ark, and wherever that ark was was where God was. It's funny, now, with Jesus Christ, he's not limited to any one place, and he doesn't have to be of one race or one people. That he is everywhere for everyone. And that was, that's the distinction between the Christian faith and the Jewish faith, that it's not limited by any of that. So... The conquering of Canaan. Canaan was already inhabited. Inherit, uh, the inheritance of Canaan was a bloody war. Three million people fought. Joshua now, by the way, I like that uh, explanation of the vesting of the priest on Facebook. Did you guys see that? Did you see it? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. This is uh, Father Barnabas Powell, uh, somebody I, I know. He explained, and maybe we'll do that also, what each piece of vestment the priest wears and what it means. But the one, the most important piece that we have is the petrachilion, the stole, and when we put it on, each, each time we put a piece of, of uh, vestment on, we bless mm -hmm. the cross that's on it, and then as we put it on, we say a special prayer. And this one basically says, uh, blessed, bless, blessed are you, O God, hang on a second, remember by heart now, um, who vests his priest as, uh, now I'm trying to, I, I, for some reason I can't think right now, but basically it says, um, As you put it on over your head and down the side your side of your beard, it says, as Aaron was anointed on his head and the myrrh ran down the, the side and down his beard, so you anointing me as I'm wearing this Petrachilion. I'm paraphrasing very liberally right now because I can't remember if I heard. But that's basically Aaron was, was sort of anointed, chosen by God, to continue the leadership that Moses um, had. And, um, and so he led the ancient Israelites uh, through this bloody uh, war. So he conquered, the, the, he tried to divide the territory between the 12 tribes, but uh, 
There were so many Canaanites that still lived. This is a time now God said, you've got to kill everybody in there. That's what their interpretation of what God was telling them. But they did it. Right? So, um, all of a sudden, you have 12 sections of this one incredible kingdom. This is the time of the judges. Okay? Twelve, the time of the 12 tribe federation. Uh, the judge was the only leader. Samuel was the best known judge. The Israelite had a problem with apostasy, and that's abandoning their faith. A lot of, a lot of the guys and women were marrying the Canaanites. They were, they were the inhabitants of the people, and they were worshiping Baal, and they were becoming uh, polytheists. They were, uh, they were leaving their Jewish faith. Um, so anyway, so now during the, the rise and the fall of the empire, uh, Roman rule 5, this is now the confederation of the 12 tribes. It, it really was, they say that it wasn't working. Uh, they were prone to attacks because of their separation. They were looking for a king, but God was to be their only king. Yet he allowed them to have their king. So listen, God says, hey, I'm going to, now remember, they were slaves for 800 years? 700 years? No, no, 500 years. 1700 to 1200, 500 years. Egyptians, under the Egyptians. Now they're free, they want to have their own country. Every great kingdom has a king. They wanted a king. But really, God wanted to be their king. And what God wanted to establish was not a kingdom in, on earth, but an earthly kingdom that was connected to heaven. Or a, a, an earthly kingdom that worshipped like they were in heaven. And so he really wanted to be their, the one face that defined the people. But they wanted a king. So they got a king, nice tall guy, Samuel. I mean, a Saul. Saul. So Saul becomes the first king. And under Saul, we know, by the way, it's funny how sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm uh, amazed. So Saul had somebody who played a, 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 a lyre, a lyre, uh, like a little guitar, an old type of guitar. Anybody know who that person David. was? David. David. Okay. And. Um, and David was the same David as? David, 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 David and Goliath, Goliath and, and King David. That's right. The same one, right? Important for us to, to know that. So there were a couple of times when actually Saul, uh, Saul tried to kill uh, David. But eventually David becomes the king after Saul. Saul was not necessarily the best ruler, but he was, he was okay. David was an incredible king. And David's best known for writing about half of the Psalms. Now the Psalms are incredible because they really talk about repentance. And they talk about um, um, sinfulness. And the Psalms will talk about God protecting you as well. Why, what motivated David to write these things? And there's a wonderful story that really defines David. David is considered you know, saintly. He's a righteous person in the eyes of the Orthodox Church. But he wasn't so righteous at one point because as many of the rulers were at that time, he had many wives, concubines, and he fell in love with a woman who was already married. And so how do I resolve this problem? Get the husband killed. Right. So let me get the husband to go to war, put him in the front line of a war we're not going to win, and I'm setting him up to die and then she'll be free to be part of my concubine. And then all of a sudden, that's exactly what happens. After this happens, under, under the guidance of Samuel the prophet, he realizes his sin, and he repents. Mm -hmm. And this is why, so why do we have St. Mary of Egypt? She was a harlot, prostitute. Why do we have her? She changed. So did David. Okay. So, in the eyes of the church, that the church says people are holy, not necessarily because they've always lived a holy life. If that were the case, I wouldn't be a priest today. But because they are an example of repentance, an example of Christian behavior at the end of their lives, at least. That, that's the most important. So, David writes about half of the Psalms. Very wise ruler. The socioeconomic uh, um, uh, 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 foundation of the empire is almost at its height. It's at its height with his son, 
Solomon, King Solomon. And everybody know, what is Solomon known for? Wisdom. Wisdom. And what's the best example of the wisdom of Solomon? Right. There are two women who are fighting, saying both of them are claiming that this baby is their child, and both are absolutely passionate and giving a good uh, 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 testimony to that, to, to that this is their child. And they get in front of King Solomon. Solomon hears this, and he says, okay, I got an answer. Okay. Ask the soldier, give me your sword. He takes the sword, he says, okay, how about this? I'm going to cut the baby in half, and both of you can have half. And all of a sudden, the one mother says, no, give it to her. And that's what he said, that's the real mother, give the baby to her. That's the wisdom of Solomon, right? So Solomon, great ruler, he, he built the temple, temple, the great temple under him. Now, unfortunately, Solomon's children were not so good, smart, uh, smart rulers. Rehoboam, and then his children after that, his children after that. So after, what you have is under King Rehoboam, you have a, like a civil war where the two, the, the empire splits in two, and you have the north and the south, okay? The, they coexist from 930 to 722 uh, BC. Then the northern, the ten northern tribes, which were called Israel, and the uh, two southern tribes were called Judah. In 722, the north is attacked by, the, uh, by Assyria, and they take the 12, back, 12 tribes back to Assyria. Anybody know what those, the ten tribes, anybody know what those Assyrians end up being called in New Testament times? Samaritans. Oh, Samaritans. Those Assyrians have become the Samaritans. They're, they were originally Jewish, but they now they were disconnected from the Jewish faith, and now they're, uh, they're, they're kind of half-breeds. And so the Jews have this sort of, uh, sort of uh, non-accepting uh, stance towards them. Um, uh, and then they, uh, the land becomes Samaria. Samaritans were half There we go. Samaritans were half-breeds. Uh, during the uh, so time of Deuteronomic reform. So um, now during this time, by, by the way, and then in 580 C, the south, the southern tribe, Judah, is conquered by the Babylonians, and then you have the Babylonian exile. And now again, the Jews have no country. The ancient Israelites have no country. During this time, after the split, after the fall of the northern, and then, and then before the fall of the southern, you have these incredible people called prophets who come in front of the king with boldness and audacity. And they speak as if God is dictating to them what to say. And it wasn't a very popular job to be a, a prophet because most of the prophets were killed, stoned, injured. Because who are you to come to me, a king, and speak to me in this way? So during the, the period of time between 538 and 36, so we're going to talk about the prophets next time we get together. But during the pre period of uh, restoration between 538 and 37 BC, the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians. Persia, Persia lets the Jews go back to the homeland. Persia is still in political control until they're defeated by the Macedonians, Empire, Alexander the Great, then the Romans take control of Palestine eventually, and then you have the Maccabean revolt in, in about 2 BC. So this is kind of the history of the ancient Israelites. This is one of the reasons why they couldn't accept Jesus Christ, because if you or Jesus as the Messiah. If you look at, they were really, really looking for another Moses to liberate them from the Romans in first century uh, Jerusalem. They were looking for another um, um, military leader, another general to lead them out in glory. And Jesus wasn't concerned about removing the political yoke that was on them by the Romans. He wanted to remove the sin and to remove the inability to be in communion with him, with him as a result of the fall of Adam and as a result of the, fact, the reality that when they died, that was it. 
So they didn't understand that. And this is one of the reasons why many of them struggled to understand that how can this humble um, man who just teaches and not, doesn't talk about uh, taking political action, how can this man be the Messiah? The Messiah needs to be like Moses, come like a general. So anyway, next time we get together, we will talk about the wisdom books, and we'll talk about the books of, uh, uh, prof of prophecy, and we'll talk about all the things that lead up to the coming of Jesus Christ. So then in March, we'll do the presentation, or we'll figure out how we do it, on, uh, by the way, on uh, Jesus Christ, the new Adam. So during this Wednesday's, by the way, questions. Too many in the last few minutes. Too many in the last few minutes? I'm sorry. Yes. I have a question regarding the reconciliation of our world with what we're trying to achieve is spiritual wellness and wellness with Jesus. What do we do with that? It's a silly everyday, maybe once a year question. What do we do with our holy water? Okay. It's building up like my Yayasik on Yeah. And we just. So it's appropriate. Kind of you see that plant over there? Yeah. It's appropriate yeah. just to pour it out right into the plant. It doesn't expire. We all drink it. And so let's say you get sick. You come the next year and you get holy water from that year. And the old holy water you pour in there. Except, you can drink it too. Okay? Except if it's like holy water from a specific place, like another shrine. If we're talking about the holy water from Epiphany, then every year you should pour the old out and get new. Yeah. I have I have bottles of holy water from uh, Zodokus Fee from 30, 20 odd years ago when I was there. Really? I still keep it okay. and occasionally I'll drink from it. There was a bottle of holy water that was found at the, the monastery of Mount Sinai that was eight or 900 years old. And they gave it to scientists and the water in that holy water vial was cleaner than the running water that they had in, in the monastery yeah. at that time. I apologize so, for that very basic. No, but, I, but what I would tell, when I tell everybody when I have a blessing in their homes, just pour last year's holy water into there, or sometimes I'll pour it inside the bowl that I, as I bless, and that's fine, okay? You, you can't get sick, but there might be some mold that might build up, as far as I'm concerned. There might, sometimes it does, but it doesn't make a difference. You're not going to get sick from it. You get sick from it if you receive it nonchalantly. No. I'm telling you, that's how you get sick. Same thing with communion, right? Yeah. Yeah, today, today I, I consumed, I was at the, at the Holy Trinity nursing home, and they just finished having this flu oh, they, epidemic. They done with the flu? Yeah, now they freed they let them, they freed them from their bondage. <laughs> <laughs> I think this was, today was the first day, first time in two weeks they were allowed to get, get off their floors. And I had communion. Guess what it was left in the communion? I consumed it. You think I had a thought that, oh, there might be some residual flu illnesses here? It's the body and blood of Christ. That's gonna bother me. One more question back there. To me, this is all very complicated. God can do anything. Why does he have these thousands of years from Adam to Christ? Why does he just say, this is, this is it, on a piece of paper, we all accept it. Why do we have to go through this history and transition and agony and... Why wasn't it just plain first day and then that's it, you're done? George, have you ever had an aha moment in your life? <laughs> where you said to yourself, something incredible just happened to me. It could be the first time you laid eyes on your wife. It could be, <laughs> it's every it, could day. be it could be a near-death experience. You know, and I've, I've had both of those things. Have you ever said, or, or something where you said, oh my goodness, I'm never going to be the same way. I'm going to change. And that happens. And then after a period of time, what happens? We go back to our old, and whatever promises we made to God, whatever promises we made to ourselves to make that change forever are forgotten. It's just, I don't know if it's human nature, if it's a, 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 an outcome of living in the fallen world, we just can't get it right, man. It's just that simple. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that the struggle, it's the struggle. That, that produces the holiness. Don't avoid the struggle. Let the struggle happen. And then just be faithful throughout the whole journey. I and think then God will tell you, don't kill your son. 
Yeah. You don't have to do that. I'll take care of you. And thank God so, he's patient with us. And he's patient. How many times? How many, imagine if God treated us the way we deserve to be treated. I mean, I tell you, I stand in front of the altar of God. I, I'm learned in all these things. And still, my daughter could do something, or one of my daughters could do something, and it's just like, oh my goodness. And then I'm like, wow. I'm just like, why did I just think that? Why did I just immediately, my, I went to like a, a thought of, of anger. Why? Don't I know better? What good will it be if I just take that and then make that scream to her and yell at her? What good will it have? What will it do? And yet, I'm still prone to do those things because I'm a human being. I know better, and I struggle. How much more do, if does everybody else struggle? You know, and it's about, it's about the constant work, about, about getting up. Just keep on getting up. You fall, just keep on getting up. And just avoid those mistakes. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. You, um, in one of the passages you were reading, where the Israelites are told to kill the Canaanites, they are told. Mm -hmm. They are told, but they don't. Right. So you said they interpreted it that way, but they were told. They were told. Man, woman, beast, child. Yeah. Um, beast. So how, be everything. Everything yeah. that was on. So how, how do we explain that? Because that honestly was an incredibly difficult concept. Right. For my sons, when they read those passages, right. to say, How What kind of God does that? How and for me, for, for, for the way that I was told to understand that, it is just the rudimentary understanding of God's will for the ancient Israelites as recorded. And for us to understand that we can, for me, my, the lesson that I take from that is that we can think that we know what God wants, but sometimes we project our will upon God. And I think that, and perhaps, and perhaps we can we can also talk about this. That perhaps that past those guidelines. Remember, we have and during this 500, the period of restoration, we have the time of the what we call the Deuter, Deuter, Deuterocanonical reform, Deuteronomical reform, where you have now these priests who are trying to guide the Jewish people. This is during that between 500 something BC till the Roman times to try to guide them. Now during that time, many of these books were written. And so the question is, are they writing it in hindsight? Saying, and projecting that upon God. So we have to look at it in a lot of different, we're using many literary tools and say, is that really something that God would say? Or, or are these writers talking about what happened, saying that had we killed all these people, then we would not have apostatized and, and we, would, we would not have lost our country. Remember, the ancient Israelites thought when we, when we had blessings is because we were in God's good favor. And if we, were dif we had difficulties, it's because we were in disfavor with God. We did something to displease God. This is why this concept of the, um, the, the innocent sufferer it was so hard. How can Jesus be the Messiah? He suffered. He was on the cross. Died on the cross. He must have done something bad to upset God that caused him to die on the cross. For them, it was a very difficult concept. You know, they, even though they had the tradition of Job and the tradition even of part of Jeremiah that talks about righteous suffering. So it's hard for me to understand. I can look at it from my academic view and say, I believe there's two ways of looking at it. One is simply that it was uh, an edit that some of the priestly writers put in there on, with the understanding that had they done that, they probably would never have lost this, their land and their, their uh, chosenness, in a sense, with God. And the other thing is that they just misunderstood. Remember, God is speaking to them. Is God speaking to them? How is God re revealing himself to, him, to them? Who is telling them? When, you, when it says God spoke to them, how did God speak? Was there a voice? <laughs> so it's hard to understand it. Again, God was everything to them. So he had to be the one to tell them, this is what you need to do because you need to protect yourselves. Because that's what they wanted from God. They wanted God to protect them. But is it still a struggle for me to understand it? Absolutely. I mean, I could look at it from an academic point of view. I could look at it from the other thing. For me, simply, I just take the, the big umbrella and I say, this is baby food. 
This, they, God, the way that God revealed to them, there were a time that they struggled to understand God's total will for them. That's the way I understand it. Even if it's in this book. Because this book talks about a lot of things that are not beautiful. Right? But in the other book, the New Testament, I've got everything there. Everything's there. There's no question. Everything's there. But those are great questions. And they're things that I struggle with to, to, really, to really explain. Um, so if you go too far academic, then it becomes just the editing of X, Y, and Z. If you, if you go over here, then you're questioning the divine authority, the, the, the inspiration, divine inspiration of it. So somewhere you have to find some happy medium. If you just look at it from a simple way, this is the baby food, this is the grown up food. This is spiritual infancy, this is spiritual maturity. Yes. Uh, Father, I was just wondering, when did they write the, uh, when did God give the Deuteronomy to Moses? He gave him the Ten Commandments first, and then was it another time, or at the same time he was up there on the mountain? No, on the mountain he got the Ten Commandments. Just the Ten Commandments. And what, We don't, there's no, there's no historical thing that says, at this point, this is what happened, this point. Is, there are scholars that will argue a lot about Moses in a lot of different ways. So we don't know the answer to that question. We know that our tradition tells us that Moses authored it or communicated, and he's given that, that uh, title as author uh, or the writer of it. But it doesn't mean that he created it. I but that's, who's, that's, the, that's the person that the Old Testament, that the ancient Israelites point to as the author of it. Because that's, that's a lot of things that it says in Deuteronomy that very specific. Very specific. The very, number, very. The sizes of this and the numbers of this, it is. It is. How do you pass all of that through a tradition for centuries? I don't know. So, to the prayers of our Holy Father, I mean, in two weeks from today, we are going to have a solid Bible study. We're going to begin with Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to begin with genealogy. Right. Very good. We're going to talk about what is genealogy, why is it important, what, and Matthew's genealogy, where he uses some women, which is never, and harlots. So, interesting stuff. We'll talk a little bit about the life of St. Matthew also. I'll give you a nice copy of his iography, of his uh, life. Okay? All right. God bless you all. You Thank too. You. Thank you.